good therapists mean well and want to help their clients, but ruptures to the therapeutic alliance get in the way. I'm Rebecca Martinez Fitzgerald, a licensed clinical social worker associate practicing with couples and individuals in Durham, North Carolina. I'm talking today with James McCracken about protecting our alliance with clients and dealing with ruptures when they arise. Hi, James. Could you introduce yourself? Hey, sure. Thanks. Um, so I'm James McCracken. I am a licensed clinical social worker and an EFT supervisor who is located in Durham, North Carolina. And I see people who are all over the state of North Carolina, mostly couples, but some individuals, um, a lot of people learning EFT and some families. Awesome. Thank you. And I should say you are my clinical supervisor and we spend yep. a lot of time talking about Alliance. Um, so I guess I just want to ask you kind of a broad view question. What makes up a strong Alliance and how do you recognize it? Yeah. So good question. Because right, like we were talking about this some the other day that we hear a lot about how important the Alliance is. We've, a lot of us have had it drilled into our head from um, grad school on and we hear it in EFT trainings about how important it is to have alliance it's step one but yet we don't oftentimes go through what that means to have a good enough alliance and and how it is that we maintain that build that and maintain it so um you know the essence of it is you can sort of think of it uh in three parts and this comes from the research goals a bond and tasks right and a good metaphor, like we were talking about the other day, is if you're on a hike, right? So you can have a, uh, you know, generally speaking, if you're on a hike with a guide, you want that guide to be enjoyable. You want to like your guide well enough. You know, you, you maybe they're a little weird. That's okay. You know, you can respect the difference, but you need them to be personable and relatable. Mm -hmm. But if all of a sudden they just, they're like, all right, I'm really glad that, you know, you like me. Here we go. And then you just go on into the woods and you don't know where you're going or what you're doing. It might not be the best experience. It might be, mm -hmm. but it might be a little confusing, mm -hmm. right? Particularly if it's a trail that you're not familiar with, or it's got scary stuff along the way. So it's really helpful if the guide can sort of collaborate with you about like, well, you know, where can we go? Where would you like to go? How can I help you get there? Yeah. So, you know, it's so not liking, like you just do this on your own. Liking and clicking enough or liking and clicking with somebody isn't really enough if they're not taking you where you want to go or the way you want to go. And, and that's right. The, the opposite, the inverse doesn't work so well either. Exactly. Right. So it's the, the bond is necessary, but insufficient. And just like, you know, if you had really clear goals set out, but you didn't like your guide, mm -hmm. and, you know, it might work, but it's probably not going to be very enjoyable. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and that's bond and goals. And then there's tasks and tasks are like, you know, you're going along the trail and your guide's like, nope, nope, we're not going to go over here. Let's go over these boulders. And if that doesn't make sense to you, you're going to be saying, well, there's this perfectly good path over here. Why don't we just do that? You know, and the, if the guide's just like, well, just because just do this. And I mm -hmm. promise you, you'll, you'll see why. Oh, okay. You, you better really trust your guide and you yeah. know, know where you're going. But it really helps if the guide says, well, the reason why we're going to go over these boulders is it's going to get us to the clearing quicker. And it may actually, it looks more uncomfortable right now, but you know, it's a really great view up ahead. Yeah. You willing to the do trust that? that? That the tasks are worth it, that the boulders are worth it to climb. Right. Yeah. So yeah, and it's, it's all about co-creating trust and establishing this um, sort of mutual sense of like, you know, what are we doing together to get where it is that we want to go with a person who we feel, you know, relatable enough with that we know if we run into trouble along the way, we can trust that we can sort of say like, hey, this doesn't feel good. Can we stop? Can we slow down? Or I'm scared. Can we go back? Or, you know, we trust the guide might even sort of pick up on that without mm -hmm. us even having to say so much about that. Yeah. Right. So a strong alliance sounds kind of funny, but it looks like a really good hike with a really enjoyable guide, a clear path that has, you know, sort of enough of the obstacles explained along the way and how it is that we're going to go about it together, or at least as we get to them, a way to engage us in that hiking process. Mm -hmm. So, so once we 
have an alliance established with our clients, you know, smooth sailing and we don't have to do anything else, right? <laughs> if only <laughs> what, it were that. Easy. What are right. what are some of the common threats to alliance? Well, there's a lot, right? And really the thing I think to think about when we talk about like what's a threat is it's it's not so much that we've got to to sort of think about eliminating threats as it is how do we respond to the things that disrupt that alliance that cause a sense of discoordination mm -hmm. um so you know the 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 big one is really not recognizing or avoiding ruptures entirely mm -hmm. they're just going to happen and it's not the the point is not to eliminate ruptures they're inevitable it's about repairing them it's exactly what we would tell couples and families as eft practitioners right so you know if you have rupture with no repair because you didn't recognize it or you're just trying to get around it then you know you have hurt without healing mm -hmm. Right. And we know what that does to a relationship. It, it piles up. It creates negative sentiment, attachment injuries. It erodes trust. It erodes any kind of positive sentiment. And then eventually things fall apart. Mm -hmm. So part one is you have to recognize that the rupture is there. Part two is recognizing what the ruptures look like. Right. And so some of them are things that are not real pleasant to look at for ourselves as therapists, because we like to put our best foot forward. We're always, I think, doing our best with what we know how, mm -hmm. but we're all prone to empathic failures mm -hmm. or, you know, misattunements, misunderstandings, um, you know, getting too far ahead of our clients or too far behind them and just mistaking kind of like where it is that they're at in the process or what they're really comfortable with. Um, and in those cases, you know, we, we really do want to get some pretty clear feedback about, you know, what's happening, what's happened and, and, you know, how it is that we can realign with people, reattune, um, you know, repair empathic failures, you know, really yeah. be able to sort of say like, I'm really sorry. I misunderstood that. And then the, the really big one that I think all of us can do better with is recognizing bias, mm -hmm. particularly implicit bias, no matter how good we think we are about it. We've all got it because unacknowledged, unaware bias leads to microaggressions and acts of exclusion. Mm -hmm. And particularly when there are differences between the therapist and the client, um, you know, there's, there's some things that can kind of come to our mind more obviously mm -hmm. um, and maybe not so obviously, you know, these, these are things like cultural differences, uh, matters of identity, race, gender expression, um, uh, sexual orientation, religious affiliation, yeah. right? Part of where are you from in the country, mm -hmm. your, you know, what's your native tongue, mm -hmm. what's your political party, right? There's, there's lots of things that go into that. Yeah. Um, so I would encourage, uh, you know, as part of the process is everyone should take the IAT, the implicit association test through Harvard's websites free, mm -hmm. um, get familiar with it, talk it out, you know, really, you know, recognize when these things come up. Cause if you don't have that, you're not going to recognize those ruptures. Yeah. You may participate in them, if not create them. Right. And then you won't know what to do about them. And the, the results of taking that implicit bias test is are, are pretty tough to stomach when you first look at them. You don't want to stumble upon them. And totally cringeworthy, yeah. right? <laughs> like no yeah. one likes to acknowledge how much of that stuff is, is real about us, yeah. but it's just a human thing that right. we all do. Right. Okay. So thank you for talking about those threats to Alliance. How can you tell when Alliance isn't strong, like is not strong in session and what can you do about it? Yeah. So a few things, um, you know, the simplest way for us to to think about it is from an EFT perspective is when you're thinking about you and one of your clients or, a, you know, a, a couple or a family, mm -hmm. it shows up in the same way that it shows up with couples and families in front of you. Okay. Withdrawal or pursuit. Right. So you know, in the research on alliance, what they call those, it's a little bit different. They talk about confrontation ruptures 
or hostility ruptures, which is what we would say in EFT is a pursuit, mm -hmm. or a uh, avoidance rupture, withdrawal rupture, which is a you know withdrawn stance or a defensive stance in the EFT terms. Mm -hmm. And you can see this both on the client side and the clinician side. So there's, there's markers of it, like on the client side for, let's say, confrontation ruptures, it's when the client is more openly complaining, grieving to you saying, I don't like this. I, this doesn't make sense to me. That didn't feel good. Um, that's a clear marker that, right, there's negative emotion in place. And we need to attend to that. We need to lean into that. <clears throat> the same thing is true on our side. A hostility rupture for a clinician can look like pathologizing the client or what they're doing, blaming them, making it as if, you know, there's something wrong with them for doing what they're doing. Um, it's really a move against. So if you see any moves that are against somebody, maybe for the purpose of establishing agency, but are sacrificing communion, that's a good marker of a confrontation rupture. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other side, for uh, avoidance or withdrawal rupture, on the client side, it's kind of what we would see in EFT terms. People, you know, numbing out, going blank, dismissing the importance or the emotional salience of something or of a relationship, um, moving away from you, you know, that sense you can have with the client where it's like all of a sudden you just can't reach them. Yeah. Uh, they're going quiet or you, you're like, what, what are we talking about? You know, like that's that's a good sign that a withdrawal rupture is occurring mm -hmm. and on the therapist side it shows up that way too you know like we're getting confused we might get really verbose mm -hmm. start using psychobabbles do too much psycho ed you know get into the stance that's um it's not it's not in the relationship it's not in the room it's not in the emotion yeah so those are, you know, a good, another indication that, okay, we need to, we need to pay attention to this. We need to sort of inquire like what's happening. Can we slow down and look at this together? Um, and, you know, like, again, like that move is usually to create communion, mm -hmm. right? So there's a good reason for it, but then it becomes at the expense of agency, right? Right. So we're, we start to see like people are losing their assertiveness and that's the thing that we really want to kind of move them back towards you know, and not just assertiveness, of course, but responsiveness, you know, you know in a EFT terms, it's how are we A-R-E? Are we accessible, responsive, and engaged? And if people yeah. aren't in that zone, chances are a rupture's taking place. Yeah. yeah, so we have to look out for that ourselves all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so it makes sense that we want to be attuned and supportive and not run headlong into ruptures all the time. How do you think about the function of rupture when that happens in your practice? That's a good question. So you can't have a relationship that is rich and deep and intimate without having rupture and repair, mm -hmm. right? We were talking about this the other day. Yeah. When you first get into a relationship with somebody, like if it's romantic and you're First dating somebody, um, maybe you have some ruptures and you repair them, and maybe that's a really good sign for what's ahead. But a lot of people, you know, they're kind of looking for the fun stuff. They're mm -hmm. they're connecting, they're feeling really positive, they're having lots of fun. And this is true of when we make friends with people. It's just you know you're just having a good time. You ignore a lot of the stuff that makes you upset. Yeah. And that's good for establishing the foundation. Yeah, new know, relationship like, energy. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, like, it's like yeah. if you built a house, you know, like if you got on your lot and you you were like, you know, building the foundation and you're like, man, this place really, I don't like this. Like, right. You just have regret, like instantly. You're probably yeah. not going to, you're not going to build a lot into your house. But if you're just sort of looking around, you're like, oh, I really love this land. I can really picture where this is going to go. You know? Yeah. You project your dreams into it. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really good to start. Yeah. But the truth of it is, is that everyone's imperfect and that people are different. They have different preferences and personalities and friction erupts. It'd be weird if we didn't have that. <laughs> be a bunch of little twins, you know, and I mean, that's kind of cool, but, you know, variety is the spice of life. So, you know, a rupture is just an indicator of difference in emotion and this kind of constant navigation between agency and community. Mm -hmm. And how it is that we work out being attached while also having our own sense of self-determination. Yeah. So ruptures are an opportunity to actually get closer to 
build a stronger connection mm -hmm. to other and self. And when we move away from those ruptures, we really short ourselves of those opportunities to grow. Yeah, I know. Just since I'm working uh, on my license, it, it it is just such a helpful reminder to 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 come back to this idea that you know, yeah, a rupture happened. It feels awkward. It feels bad. But this is an opportunity. It's not that I've you know ruined everything necessarily. Right. Well, and and some would argue it's ninety percent of what we do as therapists. Yeah. Right. And in EFT, what we know, couples come in, families come in, tons of ruptures. Mm -hmm. We help them work through the process of repairing those ruptures. And we know that they are stronger on the other side because of it. Not because we've helped them bypass it and mm -hmm. pretend that they never happened, but because they moved through them together and they made new meaning of their relationship to be even stronger and healthier than it was before. More secure. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So I appreciate you sharing about all of this. Do you have any tips you'd like to share with the rest of the Carolina EFT community? Yeah. So if, if you've, you know, in New York City, when I was living up there, there were these signs all over the subway. When you see something, say something. Uh -huh. Right. That's, I think, my first tip for everybody here is if you see something that looks like a rupture, mm -hmm. probably is, okay. and you want to invite it. You want to invite, you know, can we just look at this? We don't have to, though. If a client says, nope, I'm not comfortable with that, or, you know, no, I'm okay. Okay, right. We want to we wanna take people at their word. But we may also want to just mention, like, well, you know, I just noticed this happened, and maybe I'm making something out of nothing here, but it really, you know, it was pretty clear to me. And, 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 you know, if you wanted to avoid talking about it, that would make sense to me too. But I just want to let you know, that's really important to me that mm -hmm. when there is something that feels off or that it's, that's gone, um, you know, caused a disconnect between us, that's less than helpful. Mm -hmm. It's really good for me to, to be aware of that and to know that and to really work through that with you. So mm -hmm. when you see something, say something for the purpose of engaging your clients in the process of, of acknowledging it and repairing it, right? So, um, you know, I, I think another way to sort of look at this too, that's very EFT compatible is we have this thing in EFT called the AIRM, mm -hmm. right? That is a rupture repair process, Yeah. right? Now that's, that's when we're working with other people in, in their, their attachment injury repair model. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Like, so like, and we're working with couples or families explicitly where there's been some sort of betrayal or anything that's amounted to an attachment injury where someone's saying, I will never trust this person ever again with my right. heart. I will never get close to them. They're not safe. You know, it's blocking the, the creation of more secure attachment. Um, we, we lean into that. Well, so we want to think of ruptures the same way, right? It might not be something as serious or it might be, you know, um, but we want to, we want to, to really lean into that in a way that privileges people's experiences that may be very painful. And for us, that may be very embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Um, and we want to hear them out first about what that is, really take that in earnest help them feel heard and validated, just like we do as EFT practitioners, and then make some space when the client is ready mm -hmm. to be able to let them know some about what was happening on our side, if they're if they're interested in hearing that, so that we can co-create a new way of understanding what happened and recognize what it is that the client needed and what it is that the relationship needs in order to move forward in a way that respects the the goals the bond and the tasks in our work together. Cool. Is that making sense? It's a lot. It's making sense. It's a okay. lot. I, I do really like this. Uh, well, I, AIRM is, is a, is a, an established help in EFT, but I like the see something, say something philosophy. It is real uncomfortable, but also yeah. seems like really, really good way to, to track with our clients and, and stay mm -hmm. on top of it. Uh, New York City wisdom. It goes a long way. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, James, for, for spending time talking about this with me today. Yeah, totally. Well, and I guess if I got one more minute, I'll say sure. one last tip. Yeah. So um, 
so so I'd say for folks to watch out for, um, if you ever get a chance to um, you know read about the care model, okay, which is something that has been developed um, by some of our colleagues, um, Fion Viotis, um, Zamed Burr, um, Leanne Campbell, and Jim Furrow. Um, you'll see this in some of your trainings. Mm -hmm. It's a a framework for how to how to build an alliance in a way that is culturally contextualized and really makes room mm -hmm. for the full experience of people. Mm -hmm. It's a good way to think about how to build up a good connection with people fast. Mm -hmm. I think it's a wonderful tool and it's a, a sort of a working document and development. Um, but look out for that. If you ever get a chance to be trained or consult with any of those folks, highly recommend it. There's just a, a wealth of wisdom that they have to offer us. And something else I heard um, from re more recently from one of our trainers, James Hawkins, who's out in Arkansas, um, he had this really nice twist on a question that, you know, you know, I, I say to everybody, I've been doing it for years. I think it just comes from being a social worker, but um, which, you know, that question I ask people when they first come in is like, well, what do you think I need to know about you? Instead of going down a big, long list of, you know, uh, psychosocial assessment. Right. James's version of it was, what do you think I need to know or understand about you in order for you to feel safe enough and understood enough by me so that this process is helpful mm -hmm. and moves things in the direction that you want it? And I thought like, you know, that's a really nice contextual you know, relational way to sort of invite whatever feels important to somebody, mm -hmm. you know, um, about themselves, about their identity, you know, give them the space mm -hmm. to name that instead of having to, to pull out details that may actually make them feel disregarded in other ways, yeah. you know, because of our biases, again, about what we think is important as opposed to what the client believes is important. Yeah. How do I work with you towards your goals? Well, being a good guy. Yeah. And how do I respect your humanity? Yeah. And how it is that you've come to understand yourself in all of your depth and richness and beauty as a human. Yeah. That's so great. I love that. Well, it's been really, really great talking to you. And I'm so thankful that you made time today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And um, thanks, everybody, for watching. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, James. Bye.